Buongiorno, uh, siamo qua per la conferenza stampa del film in concorso Ferrari e uh, vi leggo a, a partire dalla destra in fondo uh, gli ospiti al tavolo. Il compositore Daniel Pemberton, il montatore Pietro Scalia, il direttore della uh, fotografia Eric Messerschmidt, Uh, il protagonista del film Adam Driver, il regista Michael Mann, l'interprete Daniela uh, Piperno e Patrick Dempsey, un altro interprete del film. Wow. Ok, here. Yes, it's there. Congratulations, everybody. It's Stephen Schaefer for the Boston Herald. So happy to be here in Venice with you guys. Wonderful uh, world premiere. Michael Mann, I wondered why Enzo Ferrari now in the 21st century to resurrect this lost world. And for Adam Driver and Patrick Dempsey, where was the point that you both committed to say, yes, I have to be in this movie and play these characters? Thanks. Um, why Mike. We, we, why answer Ferrari? Because uh, his, his story is so profoundly uh, human and when you encounter a character as dynamic as he is, as operatic as he is, the more specifically you get into the man, the more deeper the dive, the more universal it, it, it becomes. And, um, and I found that the way so many parts of him are in opposition to each other, his life uh, kind of resonated with, for me, the way life is. Um, so either... Uh, you know, it's it's melodramatic and profound, or I, or I am in fact as oppositional as he is. I don't know, but but it was uh, you know th those are the reasons why. Um, Michael and I had met about something a year before, and I th you know one always wanted to work with him. Obviously, he sent me this. I read the script, and the character was very much what he described. Uh, also just the different relationships he was with different people and how everyone would have an opinion about their version Ferrari, but this one whose internal engine was very much driven by grief and the difference in his relationship with Laura versus uh, uh, Lena Lardi versus his mother, you know, against the, at that time and that moment, you know, all seemed like a subject I didn't know uh, uh, much about and seemed daunting and exciting and and with Michael uh, being the person who's uh, you're doing it for it seemed like a kind of no-brainer to me uh, well hello everyone it's great to be here in Venice um, I read this script I think maybe 10 12 years ago I was very familiar with the story from the Ken Brock book and certainly there's a, another book called the limit by in this period in, in motorsport history has always been fascinating to me. Um, and uh, as soon as I read it, I was like, this is the best script that I've read in and around the motorsport world, and particularly in, in this era, which I find to be the most romantic and certainly the most deadly. Um, and I actively went after this. I just wanted to be a part of it in any capacity. I was uh, working in London at the time. I just had finished watching the the opening Grand Prix last year when Ferrari won. And I was like, oh, this could be the year for Ferrari. And I wanted to reach out to Michael. So I sent him an email, you know, is it, is it true that the movie's now going? And he said, yes, it is. And then I asked, could I come in and have a meeting and to discuss? And, and we had a discussion and he thought about it. And I got a call about a month later and he goes, would you like to play Piero Taruffi? And I was like, absolutely. I'd be so grateful to be a part of it. And that's how it started. Um, Michael. Um, why, with, you know, Enzo Ferrari had a long career, why did you choose this moment in his life? It's a very specific moment, it's not a happy, aggrandizing moment, you know, but it's so poignant in many ways. Uh, because in this one year of 1957, 
many of the uh, all what are the many of the dynamic conflicts that are going on in his life uh, all collide into this particular period of time. The company's going broke, but more importantly, he's just lost his son Dino, so he's in a state of grief, and he and Laura's marriage is falling apart, and they're both handling grief in two different ways. And Piero was asking, am I Piero Lardi or Piero Ferrari? So everything about the, their history and what their future is going to be all are pivoting right now at this particular moment. And to answer you know, the earlier question also, it's, um, uh, these conflicts are universal. And in Ferrari, it happens to all of us in all of our lives. So you know, grief, loss, love, passion, ambition, these are universal things. And it's all compressed in this life of Enzo Ferrari in a very melodramatic and operatic way. And so that's why, you know, Ferrari in 1957. C'è una domanda qua? Buongiorno, Annelisa Alfanderi. Volevo chiedere a proposito delle delle corse, quindi la ricostruzione della Mille Miglia, eh, come è stato? È stato difficile ricostruirla, tutte queste automobili, la rivalità tra Ferrari e Maserati? Ecco, eh, sono più esigenti i, gli spettatori normali o, qui, o i fan delle corse? Grazie. Was it to make the Mille Miglia in the race? To make the race? Yeah, and the rivalry between Maserati and Ferrari. Okay. You're asking how is it to make the race? Yeah. The, uh, I, I've done enough, uh, I've done a little bit of amateur racing, and the experience of it um, is such that two things. One is that the focus is so intensely um, on one singular objective and everything else in your life disappears. And the, that and a sense of, uh, if you like, agitation. So I wanted to bring that experience to an audience as opposed to very elegant graphics, which is also possible to handle racing. I wanted to bring something of the experience of driving these particular cars in the 1950s. So that, was, that, that influenced everything about how we shot it. And then the rivalry between and Mas Maserati and Ferrari, you know, the rivalry. Well, the, the difference between Maserati? Yeah, the rivalry between them. Um, I don't know that there is a difference between the Maserati and the Ferrari. The conflict. The conflict. The conflict. Um, the, um, the, conflict be the conflict between the two companies, are, they're both teetering on the edge, both teetering on the edge of, 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 of bankruptcy for, for, for very different reasons. Uh, Enzo is a race car driver. All he cares about is the, is, is the race team. And he went from being a driver in the 1920s, and he had some moderate success in my imagination. Or in fact, maybe he raced against Nuvolari once or twice, and it was enough to convince him you're not a race car driver, and he started managing the Alfa Romeo team. And so that, that's, his, that's his priority. That's his imperative. And uh, everything about the business is only to support the racing. Maserati is a completely different story. And uh, by that point, the, Ar the Orsis had taken over from the Maserati brothers. And, um, and they were trying to run the business. But Italy was still in, you know, this is 1957. The economic recovery does not happen until 1962, 63. So, uh, so life is difficult and everything is hand, is hand to mouth. And so one or two companies are going to survive. But what I found fascinating about this conflict is that it wasn't just Maserati versus Ferrari. They also had two football teams and two opera companies also right in Modena. You had the Cominale and then you had the Storky. So it, it seemed to be a town in which everybody was gravitated towards dualities and competition. So. Qua. Una domanda qua. It's Ben Dalton from Screen International. This is a question for Adam Driver. Um, congratulations on the film, and it's great that you're able to be here to support it. Um, I was just wondering, in the midst of the ongoing sag after strike, if we could hear your thoughts on that strike, and if you had any message for the 
heads of the studios and major platforms were part of that equation. No, I'm very happy to be here to support this movie and the, the truncated schedule that we had to shoot it and the efforts of all the in, incredible actors working on it, the, uh, the crew. But also I'm very proud to, to be here to kind of be a visual representation of a movie that's not a part of the AMPTP and to promote the what a SAG leadership directive, which is a, 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 an effective tactic, which is the interim agreement, which is uh, twofold, which it allows independent movies that aren't have, have no association with the, the writer is a, a non-WGA member for independent movies to be made. I think it is like 15 percent, more than 15 uh, percent of WGA. So the majority of independent films are the opposite. So not to to, to stop the bleeding a little bit as far as some people in IATSE and SAG to be able to go to work. But the other uh, uh, objective is to obviously say, why is it that a distribution company, a smaller distribution company like Neon and STX International can meet the dream demands of what SAG is asking for? And this is pre-negotiation, the, 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 the dream version of, of SAG's wish list but a big company like Netflix and, and Amazon can't. And every time people from SAG go and support a movie that is, uh, ha has agreed to these terms, the interim agreement, it just makes it more obvious that these people are willing to support the people that they collaborate with and the others are not. So when this opportunity came up, it seemed like understanding the interim agreement, it's a no brainer for all of these reasons why you wanna support your union. And, and, and I'm here because of that to support to stand in solidarity with them by showing up and just further proving the point that it really is about the people that you make it with. And I mean, that's very resonant with our movie. It feels like the we made it, uh, uh, and I can maybe let PJ uh, speak to it more than I can, but it, it, was, it, was, it was touch and go. It seems like one time someone was in the catering department, the next time they're on set with us uh, playing a part in the movie. You know, it's very impromptu and you're battling obviously, uh, 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 nature and time and all these things it's, it, that a movie is made at all is a miracle. So uh, uh, this one in particular felt uh, very important to show up for and again to be here for my union and to support the, the interim agreement. Yeah. yeah, I would I would I would add to that that the uh, individually and collectively we all stand in total solidarity with SAG and also with the Writers Guild strike as well. And the uh, SAG particularly, uh, and I'm quoting from, from uh, the SAG was released, is that uh, to be crystal clear, once the agreement is in place, we fully encourage our SAG after members to work under that agreement and promote work made under that agreement because it benefits SAG in their, in their negotiations. And this, this picture Ferrari got made because of the, the people who worked on Ferrari made it uh, by, as, as, by um, foregoing large percentages of salaries, in the case of Adam and myself, producers such as PJ and John Lesher, who basically worked for no fees, and cutting like that. That's why this picture got made. So it was not made by a big studio. No big studio wrote us a check. And, uh, and that's why that's why we're here, standing in solidarity with with both unions. Yeah. There's a question there. Yeah. It's okay. Eh, buongiorno, Maestro Mazzetto, l'altra pagina. I have a question for Michael Mann. Uh, first of all, thank you because I grew up in a family of uh, car workers, so you give the right uh, attention, the emotion I feel when I go to watch the rallies. And I want to know, how do you work on the sounds of the engines uh, for the actor, for Adam Driver and Patrick Dempsey? How do you feel to drive these uh, historical and mythical cars? Thank you very much. How do we work with the sound? <laughs> um, the sounds you're hearing are actually the sounds of those real cars. So, for example, the Maserati single-seater that uh, that Bayrod drives is historical. That's a, the, the cars are historical cars. It's owned by Nick Mason, the drummer from Pink Floyd. And we recorded at the time, but then we went back about seven or eight weeks ago and loaded that car up with seven and eight microphones and recorded it in every situation. We did the same thing with competition V12 Ferraris. So not just V12s in the period, they're actual competition V12s. 
And so it's, uh, the sound's authentic, and there's nothing quite like it. They're both beautiful and threatening and savage and very emotional. So thank you for recognizing that. And there was a question for Adam Driver. No, Patrick. Oh, it was. Yeah. Well, uh, the feeling of driving the actual cars, yeah. If it's for the scariest cars. day on set. They wouldn't let me drive the cars for insurance reasons. <laughs> As I said before, you know, making a movie is a miracle, and they don't want me touching the thing that's the most expensive part on the... <laughs> uh, I, I don't drive the cars except at, in pre-production we raced Ferraris to kind of get a, uh, uh, obviously newer Ferraris. I uh, can't afford the other ones. And then at the beginning, you know, I'm, it's, uh, I'm not driving that one. Uh, it's on a, a, a dolly. Again, they don't trust me with uh, small uh, pieces of equipment, you know, <laughs> big pieces of equipment like sandwiches, you know, they, <laughs> they'll, they'll let me handle. But, but uh, Patrick can more speak to that. Yeah, it was quite terrifying, actually, driving a, a modern car. You have a roll cage. There was no cage in this car. It was a caterham chassis. Uh, and the same family built all the bodies traditionally. You want to tell that story? What, about the cars? About the cars and how uh, they were the built? Car, the cars started by us t taking a, um, a three-dimensional LIDAR scan of actual cars. And tonight you will see it, the actual car that Tarufi won the race in will be out there tonight on the red carpet, the real car, not the ones we built. And, the, um, and we took that LIDAR and put it in a CAD computer program and then custom designed a tubular frame or chassis, and then had a Caterham uh, four-cylinder twin cam engine driving it. So the cars are absolute perfect replicas of, uh, of the real Ferraris and, Ma and Maseratis. Yeah, we had a sequential gearbox, which was really nice and very quick. The balance of the car was really good, really neutral. So as we were... Doing the racing sequences, certainly the, the, the beginning part of the Mille Mille at night was really quite uh, exhilarating uh, because we kept going faster, 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 and visibility was terrible. And I was like, what am I doing here? You know, there's no roll cage. This is really frightening. And then it gives you a much better perspective of what the drivers in that particular era were going through and the risks that they were putting their their themselves in their uh, fellow competitors at it, racing that closely, but it was exhilarating. It was really quite uh, exciting. And um, there was one particular kink in this section of road that we were running and couldn't quite see. And uh, to be driving with uh, the Strun drivers and the other racers in this was really exhilarating and fun. And, and, and you felt like you stepped back in time, uh, which was quite remarkable. Also, the sense of how dangerous they were to what Patrick is talking about, that seatbelts wasn't an act of negligence. It was, just wasn't a part of the culture at the time. And the way we're, you know, uh, car seats are now, and then they weren't, you know, in the 80s and 90s. It's just it, the, almost the goal was to be thrown from the car as, yeah. a, as, a, uh, as a safer way of, of a crash than, mm -hmm. than staying with it is, again, a, a time capsule. And the fear of fire was a big thing as well. Lynn with Cinema Magazine, great to see you guys. Um, Michael, I'm really curious, especially in reference to a biopic, there's a fine line between honoring a legacy and navigating through the myth, specifically of a person. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that journey as you were constructing it. And Adam, going back to cars, I mean, since Patrick, we all know that he likes to race, how daunting was it to be around these? Did you have a new appreciation for these race cars now? I mean, are you intrigued? Uh, biopic, biopics to me are linear and belong on the History Channel. So they're documentaries and I'm not interested in, in that at all. Making somebody come alive as, as uh, dynamically operatic and melodramatic as Enzo was in these unique circumstances of Modena, in, which, is not, which is like no other place, in 1957, um, in this critical crisis uh, of his life, uh, to me, is a, is, a, is a drama, and it's, it's, it's better than anything I could make. The real story, the real Enzo, is better than anything I could, I could make up. But from everything from his strafing wit and his humor, which is there in his writing, which is very good, by the way, um, you know, to uh, the situations with Lena Lardy and, and Laura and, um, 
and we did a lot of, there's a lot of research and a deep dive into that life, both with Laura's doctor, who's still alive, and then with Lena Lardy's niece, and finding out everything about that, you know, that, that, uh, that the fabric of the culture and the people and the way they thought and dressed and everything they did in this little microcosm of Modena. Um, so question here. Um, yeah, it was less about uh, understanding how impressive the cars are. It was more interesting to me the mindset of a racer. I mean, it's obvious that the technology in 1957 and Ferrari in particular was way more advanced, and that's a resonant now. But the mindset of when we were racing cars in pre-production with Ferraris and open wheel uh, rebels with basically essentially a, a um, uh, motorcycle engine, but you, you become painfully aware what Michael was talking about before. In a way, it's the opposite of escapism. It's absolute focus on the moment that's happening right now. There's no, there's no room for uh, d daydreaming or, or uh, losing focus and attention because of, uh, it's dangerous. You'll, you'll, you'll crash, obviously. So that, that, the mindset was helpful in playing the character, where it, there is absolute, he's instinctive, He's impulsive. It's pre-psychology. He's making decisions in a vacuum because he's used to doing them alone. He's built a way of coping with that, of, of death, and especially with people that he's cared for, not only by his son, but uh, teammates who have died because of the metal that he's made, like he says uh, in the movie. So uh, building those guardrails for himself and, and the mindset of absolute focus and absolute presence uh, was really helpful. Uh, so that, that was the big thing that I had appreciation for is, is and, and it's hard, Michael would talk about this all the time, it's hard not to get philosophical about an engine, actually. <laughs> it, it's true, it's the amount of pieces that have to come together, similar to films, oh. and work on the exact right timing and the exact right moment, uh, and, and then miss this missing element of human intuition and, uh, and reflex, you know, it's, it's a 50-50, um, a marriage, and that's very much filmmaking or anything. The, the amount of things that have to come together for something to uh, operate, you know, is beautiful, and it also makes you aware of how many things can go wrong at, at any moment. But when it happens, you know, it's it's a, a special thing to be a part of. It's it's a drivable clock or or uh, you know a moving piece of art. So that that part, I I. Uh, I'd never considered before and, and was a, a helpful internal engine for, for the character. Yeah, and, and some of that came from, uh, let me add something, some of that came from uh, the generosity from the factory, uh, and particularly uh, Gabriella Lali, who worked in the Classique division, and we, who demonstrated the inside of a Lampredi V12 Right. Yeah. To, to Adam and I, and it looks like the inside of a beautiful watch, and I think that all this moves in perfect synchronicity at 8,000 RPM is just incredible, uh, particularly given metallurgy in the 50s. But one of the things I'd add is that from the, from the driving, one of the other aspects of it is the addiction to the, eufor the euphoria right. of it, and that's something that the Jean Beirat was very uh, literate about, um, and uh, and he witnessed the Costalotti crash, and that's how we know what happened on that chicane in the autodromo in the beginning. And he referred to it as this ridiculous euphoria that we're all addicted to, but that is central to uh, to Enzo and to Anna's portrayal of Enzo's character, that that drive. And I'm you know I'm sure Patrick could talk about this more than I can. So. There is a high from the experience because of. I think Adam spoke so beautifully about it. The mindfulness aspect of it is you are in the present. You're aware of everything that's happening in front of you, beside you, and behind you. And with that level of intensity after a long run, especially in an endurance race, you come out in a, in a completely different place. And it's transcendent in that sense. And that's what the beauty is. That's the addiction of it. That's what's hard to give up, that, that moment of... Uh, it's a calm exhilaration that just, it's how we should be living. It's what all of the spiritual books talk about, is being in the now and being in the present. And I think racing does that. Or any sport where you have to be that focused because your life depends on it. And I think that's what's so special about it. And it's up to you to really dive into that. 
and to stay that focused. And it, it's, it's hard to put into words the feeling. I wish you could all experience it because it is so magical. I like I like to bring uh, Daniela in the in the conversation as one of the uh, three women in in you know in Ferrari's life, and it's a fascinating triangle. And I you know if you can talk about your experience in the film and and, and about the character itself of, of Ferrari's mother. Lavorare con Michael è stato come danzare con Nureyev, cioè essere presa per mano da una persona di grandissimo talento che ti porta verso il suo talento e quindi ti fidi e sei felice. Questa è stata la condizione, il mio stato d'animo che si verificava ogni giorno, che stavo sul set e provavo e recitavo con Adam e Penelope sotto la guida di Michael. Il personaggio poi mi è piaciuto moltissimo perché eh, c'è un termine americano che si dice bici, no? che sei un po' così, <ride> non sei proprio simpaticona, ecco. Questo modo di essere l'ho trovato audace, cioè una che ha il coraggio di essere così odiosa che fa ridere. E siccome Beckett diceva che non c'è niente di più comico dell'infelicità, qui ho trovato proprio la verità di questa cosa, perché lei è una donna straziata dal dolore. Gli è morto il marito, è morto il primo figlio che adorava, quindi la scatena la sua rabbia, la sua frustrazione sul suo figlio... Enzo, se può, gli dice cose riduttive, lo mortifica, cioè tremenda, tremenda, e sotto ha un enorme dolore, però è così tremenda che fa ridere, e questo diciamo che è una delle cose che mi piace di più nella vita, ecco, che ci sia dell'ironia e, e che soprattutto venga raccontata l'ambivalenza di cui siamo fatti, no? in ogni personaggio, in ogni scena, in ogni battuta di questa sceneggiatura meravigliosa, c'è una cioè, il personaggio dice una cosa e poi c'è un'azione che smentisce quello che ha detto cioè racconta l'ambivalenza di cui siamo fatti questo film, parla di noi continuamente con una verità eh, che rende tutto vero appunto e secondo me è bellissimo quindi io sono contentissima abbiamo una domanda qua <ride> This is Matit Smaitsen from uh, the daily newspaper Vecheri in Slovenia. I have a question for Adam Driver. Adam, in the past couple of years, we've seen you play two renowned Italian personalities, first uh, Maurizio Gucci and now Enzo Ferrari. And I'd just like to ask, how do you deal with that extra layer of responsibility that comes with playing the, those kind of characters? And are those the kind of challenges that motivate you and drive you forward as an actor? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it seemed we were talking about this earlier. It's the place is the thing, you know, where it seems hard to make this, you know, movie in in Belgium with because of tax credits, you know, like it, you have to kind of be in the place and smell the manure from the farms and see the vista, go to the factory, uh, hear the engines. It just it, it immersion is similar to learning a new language is is the thing uh, uh what you pick up from the crew and that that understanding of a different culture is the is the thing that i love most about being an actor and what's lucky about being an actor is forced empathy you're forced for two or three months or for a year leading up to it to um uh, empathize with someone who's different from you and who's made diff different choices at a different time and without judgment, look at their life honestly and with uh, some sense of perspective and try to immerse yourself in what you think. It's a very weird job, but it's what I I'm interested in. And it connects me to people that I uh, normally would probably never interact with. And, and you're lucky enough to go to the place that helps you. It's hard to, it's hard to, I, I would imagine it'd be more difficult to do that when you're not, when you're not there. But I, I, I trap or a, um, a danger of it is we were shooting it in Modena, surrounded by Ferrari iconography, going to the uh, Ferrari Museum, seeing, you know, how much the uh, Ferrari symbol, the name, the person, the contradictory stories, the personal associations, the restaurants that he went to means to people. So there's an added responsibility to, to not fuck it up, to take it seriously, and, uh, but not get so uh, 
uh, distracted by playing someone else's version of that person. At a, at a certain point, this is the version that we're telling in our story. This is our script. If someone wants to write a different script about a different time in his life, that's them, but we're focusing on uh, this ver version, so owning it. It's, like, it's similar with playing anybody real. You feel like you take the pieces of them that open your imagination, and then the minute that starts getting in your way or stopping an impulse, uh, you kind of, you have to cut it out, you know? So, but it, it, there for sure, to answer your question shortly, it is an added responsibility because it's not your culture. So it seems like uh, you have to know more. You have to uh, really immerse yourself in the place is a massive uh, part of it. And even from Roberto, who is our camera operator, who is, you know, a good uh, uh, sounding board. I mean, not to blame him if, if you don't like things in the movie that don't feel natural to you, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he'd go, no, no, no. Yeah, he'd be, no, no, no. Uh, it, it's hard not to absorb, uh, you know, and have a checks and balances when it's, you know, you, immediate response from people in the room or, or you just naturally absorb. You, know, you go to, I'm over explaining the answer, but uh, being in the place. You know, I, so. I have a I have a follow up question for Michael on on this. When you know when we saw the movie for for the selection, you know you have American filmmakers that come and film in Italy, you know, and there are American films made in Italy. This one felt an Italian film. F uh, is a film that captured completely the post war culture in our country. This the, the the role that this major industrialist had, you know, in the economy and for the local population. So Michael, how did you? What fascinated you about that, and how? How did you capture it? The um, uh, it, it kind of like by, by having a, uh, a an approach and doing work that's kind of similar to cultural anthropology. You have to immerse yourself as deeply as you can in the place, uh, in in the people. What are the uh, values? What's the authority structure at 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 at, at at the time, and in Modena, which is very unique, but it seems like nobody ever leaves Modena. If they leave, they come back. I could walk out of the apartment we had and go around the corner and sit in the same barber, sit in the same barber chair that Enzo sat in and get a shave by the son of the barber that shaved Enzo every morning. And then right around the corner, it was Enzo's house, and next door to that is the Storky Opera. And so the that the compression of space, but the more in the um, uh, in, in 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 the more so there's the physical place, but the more uh, challenging and exciting part is attitude, psychology, um, uh, what 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 is typically marriage, what's extra marital, how those relationships form, uh, Lena Lardy's situation in the world ten years after the end of World War II, and it had to be 12 years after the end of World War II, and there had to be a number of single mothers in Italy at that moment in time. Uh, Lara, as a conventional woman, bereaved by the loss of her son and kind of imprisoned by that, whereas Enzo, also begrieved and in a state of grief, is in fact planted in the present, looking only into the future. That's all he, everything is what's next. Some people said to, say to Enzo, what's your favorite car of all the cars you built? He'd always, the answer was always the next one. So, and, and the way these lives are all operating in opposition to one another is, uh, is kind of was fascinating. But um, you, you, you we, we do the work and we, um, we're correct as we go. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, obsessed with getting important things right. Adam's obsessed with getting important things right. We realize at one moment in time that maybe we don't have gestures. So there's this wonderful scene where Adam says, Fuzaro, Fuzaro. And so we, we, we build these things in there and do it with great care, particularly with the language. I made a decision. I made a decision early on that the way we should handle language is not hire British actors and speaking in British accents, which is the typical way this is done, but in fact to speak um, American English with an Italian accent, except for place names, and then to get that accent as accurate to uh, to the region uh, as as possible, and um, and we continue to work on that through post production, and that's, that was very important. But I should say that that is a process that's dictated by Michael. That's because he set up a way of working that allows people to do that and approaching it with not commenting on the thing that we're making, and he is a great. Uh, 
uh, audience member for for acting and making sure that everyone feels very much of the place, but but only with like uh, because he's made time in the schedule and and there's a clear directive of of the the nuances and different dialects from different regions that someone has to keep track of that and if you're not part of a process where people aren't doing that then I feel like it starts to get wayward and that's that's the the borders that Michael has kind of set up. Well, there's a certain brusqueness to the to the Modenese mentality that that I met Scaglietti many years ago when he was a very old man. There's a certain gruffness, and what fascinated me was that when Y would interview Scaglietti and put it on Italian television, they had to subtitle it in Italian because nobody understood. Nobody understood him. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, just get that plus the attitudes of of, of Modena, and you know, that's 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 the work. But I'm, I'm very you know, very gratified at the question because this audience is the toughest test <laughs> of all the work we did, and I know that if we missed, we'd hear it. So, unfortunately, we have to uh, we have to stop the, uh, here. They already called me twice. Uh, il uh, Ferrari ha, ha una distribuzione italiana che è in esclusiva Leone e arriverà nelle sale attraverso Zero Uno Distribution entro la fine dell'anno. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.